Hey there and welcome back to episode 8 of season 1. Uh, we are now coming to the end of season 1 and so I had no choice but to speak a little bit about Harriet Tubman. Now, she was an activist, an abolitionist, a nurse, a union spy, and last but not least, a union scout in the actual Civil War, making her the first woman to lead a combat assault. Now, Harriet Tubman was born in Dorchester County, Maryland in 1820. The exact date is unknown. It actually contradicts itself quite often. Um, on her tombstone, it says a different date. On her birth certificate, it says another date. And a lot of people claim a third date. But we're just going to put 1820 to make it easier, right? Now, a lot of people claim she may have been an Aries. The Aries season is between March 20th to April 21st. Now, she was born into the family of Father Benjamin Ross and her mother, Harriet green a lot of people actually just called her writ so we're going to harriet was born with the name araminta however she did change it later on in her life one she most likely changed it in order to honor her dear mother and or mainly to change identity later on for escaping now she was one of nine siblings mariah rachel moses lina Sof, ben henry and robert ross so yeah, let's get into it. Her parents were actually enslaved already, right? As many other African-American people at the time. Their ancestors, their great-grandparents um, had actually been taken from Africa, moved across the sea all the way to the USA. And in the USA, they were enslaved, sold, tortured, etc. as we all know by now. Harriet Tubman parents had been enslaved since she could remember, basically, making her and her siblings born slaves for the family of the Thompsons. Now, the family of the Thompsons consisted of Mary Patterson Brodes, her son Edward, and her second husband at the time, Anthony Thompson. They owned a whole plantation near Blackwater River in Maryland, where they had many slaves working in different jobs at the time. If the people there weren't old or strong enough to work at the plantation however they could actually work at the main house of the thompsons which is where harriet's mother worked almost all day making it impossible for her to really spend any time of, uh, with her family another reason was the fact that the thompsons had already taken three of ritz's daughters and were actually attempting to kidnap and sell her son moses which was i think one of the younger kids this was to sell him to other slave owners of the area after having lost obviously three of her beautiful children Rit was terrified of losing the rest and so she would try her best to stay at the house in order to keep an eye out for her children this is why she then hid her son for around a month or so until the thompsons it was actually edward thompson that caught them when he attempted to actually grab her son Rit replied with you are after my son, but the first man that comes into my house, I will split his head open. This wasn't a very common act. It wasn't a very common response to slave owners in general. And such an act of rebellion then obviously go without some sort of consequence. Now here is where Harriet Tubman recalled the first moment in when she noticed that maybe fighting back actually worked to fight injustices and get some sort of freedom. Because of this taste of freedom, she actually carried that same way of thinking across her entire life journey. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, the abuse and her actual experience with enslavement. As if being born in such circumstances wasn't already extremely unfair, people that were slaves were also made to work from, from the start of their childhood, basically. This didn't differ whatsoever in Harriet's case, obviously. So when she was around five to six years old, she was made to work as a nursemaid for another woman called Miss Susan. Here she had to take complete care of this woman's children. Uh, she had to rock them to sleep most of the time. She had to feed them, bathe them, etc, etc. However, when they awoke and began to cry, she would actually get whipped because of it. One of the most prominent memories of Harriet's was once she was whipped around five times before breakfast had even been put on the table. She was left scarred for life, both physically and mentally, obviously. Harriet, however, wasn't really one to be abused without fighting back, which she did often, very often, in various ways. Some of the most significant were the following. 
She would wear multiple layers of clothing. She would argue or fight back. And if that wasn't enough, she would also run away quite often. Obviously, she would get punished later. Now, during her childhood, she also tried to work for another man near the plantation. She attempted to work for a man named James Cook, who was actually a planter. And her job at his plantation was basically to look for and check for musk rat trap. Now, these were surrounded by marshes most of the time and different types of plantations which actually caused many illnesses. Here is where she would often get sick until it was near fatal ones when she contracted measles and her mother luckily nursed her back to health. Now this type of abuse continued well into her adolescence where another very particular scenario happened. One day whilst working at the plantation fields, another slave in the area attempted to escape in broad daylight, which caused for one of the slave owners to try and throw a two pound weight of metal at him. Tragically though, it landed on Harriet Instead, this broke her skull open, causing her to bleed so much she actually became unconscious. Instead of rushing her to a medical facility, which would be like the common sense, they actually decided to take her back to the main house of the Thompsons, where they left her to lay on the sofa for around two to three days without any medical assistance whatsoever. Now, doctors claim she may have suffered of temporal lobe epilepsy, symptoms which would last for the rest of her life. She would often experience brutal and severe headaches. She would fall unconscious and seizures actually started to manifest along as well. Other symptoms that were here to stay were actually the visions she began having and what she called guidance of God. She continued to believe in her visions and became very invested in her faith, which was Christianity. She didn't really agree with the image of the New Testament, really. She felt it kind of allowed or perpetuated the whole situation of slavery at that moment, which was very prominent in the USA at the time. She actually preferred the Old Testament, which gave her a sense of kind of freedom and equality no matter the race. Now we're going to be talking about her escape. Now after several years of constant torture, her father's owner actually came to an agreement with him that he would manumit him. Now manumit is basically the act of setting a slave free or letting a slave go. So the father's owner actually came to an agreement with him that he would manumit him his wife and their children when they both turned around 45 years old. However, when they actually did turn 45, Harry's father attempted to have this procedure actually come through and it didn't since the Thompson family completely ignored the situation, completely lied about the previous promise. And instead, they actually chose to inherit the enslavement of their children completely. Because of a lack of money and no power whatsoever, obviously, Harriet couldn't legally battle against this. So she had to give up. Her dad was set free and he actually bought her mother's freedom, but their children were still, I guess, property, quote unquote, of the slave owners. So in 1849, when she was around 29 to 30 years old, she actually became greatly ill once again. She would she actually had a record of getting ill quite often. So what would happen is when slaves were ill, they were considered of a lower value, mainly because they couldn't overwork or be exploited, which is exactly why the Thompsons intended to sell her but they actually couldn't find a buyer i personally think it was just god obviously angered at the situation she was in because imagine not only being a slave but then also being sold like you're a fucking product of course you're going to be infuriated and because of this her only resource at this point was actually praying so what she did was she prayed that her owner would change his ways, that he would change his way of thinking. This is what she claimed later on. She said, and I quote, I prayed all night long for my master till the 1st of March. And all that time he was bringing people to look at me and trying to sell me. Now, when she noticed that the Thompsons were near concluding a sale, she actually changed her prayer. And she said, 1st of March, I began to pray. Oh Lord, if you ain't never going to change that man's heart, kill him, Lord, and take him out of the way. Which actually, funnily enough, the Lord did. A whole week as later, Brodus actually died, to which Harriet expressed regret for later on. Because of this, the likelihood of her being sold and enslaved again by someone else was extremely high. It was peaking. Because of this, she actually just chose to escape. She later told, there was one of two things. I had a right to liberty or to death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. Her and her brothers then managed to actually escape on September 17th, 1849. Because her and her brothers all worked for the Thompsons and outside the main house most of the time. The owners actually didn't notice when they made their escape. She actually didn't notice their absence until two weeks later when she decided that she would actually post a reward of around $100 for each slave to be returned to their facility. 
Now, when Harry and her brothers heard this, because, you know, rumor was starting to spread around, her brothers had second thoughts. <laughs> Since one of them was supposedly a soon-to-be father, whilst the other was just completely terrified. When they made their way back, they actually forced Harriet with them, which only happened that one time because she actually escaped once again. However, this time by herself through an underground railway, which was actually very known among slaves as a path to freedom. Now, this path to freedom had actually been created by a group of freed slaves, abolitionists and helpers that were against the whole enslavement of African-American people in general. Now, this group of people were actually referred to as Quakers. Now, the Underground Railway was actually a journey of around 90 miles in total. Now, typically slaves, they would actually go throughout this path but they would stop every time it was daylight. So they would rest in daylight and then continue on their path at night. This was mainly for a few reasons. One, the obvious reason to avoid slave catchers looking for rewards. Now, slave catchers were basically other white people. And what they did was basically hunt slaves in order to get the reward that their slave owner promised. The trail was actually from the Preston area near Poplar Neck. After a stop there, they would actually continue through Choptank River, through Delaware, to northern Pennsylvania. So that was the final destination. After one hell of a journey, hiding in daylight, being carried in boxes by fellow Quakers, traveling at night in the pitch black darkness, barely a stop to pee, Harriet finally crossed the line into Pennsylvania. Here's how she described it a few years later. When I found that I had crossed the line, she says, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. Now, I'm going to be moving into more of the activist phase she had in her life, and here's where it bloomed. After her arrival in Pennsylvania, Harry actually missed, obviously missed her family back home, and she knew that if she could be free, then they should also be free. Because of this, she actually decided she would go and liberate them one by one take them all the way to Pennsylvania. However, she would actually need some sort of money and help. And so meanwhile, what she did was she worked different odd jobs here and there, uh, which were actually quite hard to find at the time, mainly because there had been an, there had been an increase in Irish immigrants who would actually compete with now three African-American people for the job. After some time, she actually heard that her niece and her children were close to being sold off to some buyers in Cambridge. So what she did was she went to the auction herself. There she just hid before the sale. Luckily, before she could even act, the highest bidder had actually been her niece's husband. So what he did was buy his family back, basically. Now, their family completely remained intact, thank the Lord. And then they traveled and then they were greeted by her in Pennsylvania. Now, the second time she made an escape plan was for her to reach Maryland in order to rescue her brother Moses and reunite with him once more. She actually managed to save another two unidentified men at the same time, which is amazing. So what they did is they, you know, went along this journey and then they all reached safety luckily, which is so unfathomable since at the time of her escape, there had actually been a change to the laws. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was passed, which said that helping or abetting the escape of the slaves was actually a crime, that even states that had previously abolished slavery had to participate in the capture of slaves, regardless of their own laws. This made the entire situation 10 times more difficult, 15 times worse, to put it mildly. For her third escape, I'm going to give some context. Harriet had actually managed to, you know, find a husband while she was in the plantation. She dedicated this third escape entirely to her husband, whom she had left when she chose freedom. Now, upon her return to Dorchester, she noticed that her husband had now remarried, which the audacity <laughs> and when she sent for him to accompany her he actually refused because you know he had remarried he was happy he had kind of started over harriet didn't really take this too well <laughs> she initially had planned to just kind of grab him and then leave and you know choose freedom however she then decided to just kind of let things go instead so she actually saved another 11 slaves from Maryland. Now we're going to be moving on to the next phase. She had actually started becoming the Moses of the slaves. She would actually guide them throughout the night herself in person in order to reach safety as they made their escape. After many years of doing this, guiding people to safety and freedom, she still had never ever not once lost someone on the journey. Now rumor has it that she actually carried a gun on her 
in case they did encounter themselves with slave hunters and also to just kind of make that none of the now free slaves did anything stupid that would put them in danger. So she went to extra lengths making sure her plans would just go on flawlessly. Because of this however she did have to do a few things that maybe I don't think she would have been really comfortable with. So what she did was for example with little children she would actually have to drug them in order to be silent throughout the journey so that they wouldn't get caught. Then once they had reached a certain point or they had been freed she would actually lead the people to shelters and houses where they could just start again someone else at the exact same time had been doing something similar and his name was frederick he was also an activist but more so in the public sense of things harriet was the other side you know the side that most people don't really witness they greatly respected and inspired each other now over the next 11 years or so harriet managed to save around 70 people in 13 different occasions and trips to Maryland. She had much help on her rescues along with other Quakers and former enslaved people. And they all planned her disguises as well. You know, she she went all the way out, basically. <laughs> sometimes she would travel in boxes. Sometimes they would travel together. Other times she would actually dress up. And I remember the scene, Harriet was actually on her way to free some slaves when she actually came across directly with a slave owner. And luckily, thank the Lord, she actually had been carrying two chickens. And because she was carrying two chickens, she actually avoided eye contact with him completely. Had she actually made eye contact with him, had he not been distracted, maybe she would have actually been assassinated right there and then so yes that moving on what also helped her were actually the constant visions that she had of the lord and her undying faith for him all her confidence in him and regularly prayed for safety now we're getting to the conclusion now after many years of activism she actually decided to free way more people at the same time so i'll be telling you about one of her greatest escapes which they're all amazing but like this one hits different one of her most famous raids in freeing slaves was actually the combahee river raid where she organized many ships to arrive at the Combahee River. Here's where she actually became the first woman to lead an armed assault in the Civil War. The plan was this. The plan was to completely destroy the plantations there and obviously free the people enslaved, which they did successfully. Now, once they had actually set fire to the infrastructures and had actually started fighting against the slave owners, is when they actually managed to save around 750 or so slaves from the site, which is crazy. Many slave owners actually attempted to fire back, but to no avail, as they had actually managed to get everyone aboard by the time they noticed what was going on. Now, she actually described the scene a few years later, and I'm going to be reading it to you now. I never saw such a sight, she said later, describing a scene of chaos with women carrying still steaming pots of rice, pigs squealing everywhere in bags, slung over shoulders, and babies hanging around their parents' neck. Although their owners, armed with handguns and whips, tried to stop the mass escape, their efforts were nearly useless in the tumult. Now, onto her last few years, which sadly weren't as great as you would think. Even though she had actually been a part of many institutions and worked really hard at not only freeing guiding and healing wounded former slaves for her entire life. She had also managed to work for the Union forces, which she actually never got paid for and rarely got compensated. Essentially, she had actually been set up to live a poor life because she had spent so much time as a humanitarian she actually couldn't receive a government pension whatsoever. Now, people that had supported her throughout her years and were actually inspired by her story actually helped raising funds for her to live from buying the biography she had collaborated on with a writer. Even though in her younger years she had managed to save enough money to pay for a residence in New York, where she kept most freed slaves hidden throughout her life and where she now nursed her family, uh, she actually had no type of income to survive, you know? So she had a property, but she didn't have enough to eat. Because of this, many people helped her throughout her last few years. She actually gained a whole lot of popularity when she participated in the women's suffragettes movement, where she gained many inspired women as a following. Uh, she ended up spending her last few years taking care of her family and later on moving and living in Auburn, where she continued to give her help and aid to the community. She died of old age at the age of 91, and she died on March 10th, 1913. I strongly suggest if you are traveling or you're living in the USA or you're planning your trip I would definitely check out Maryland uh, check out all the museums the monuments the art the music the poems 
everything that has to do with dear Harriet Tubman. She did so much, contributed so much to society as a whole. She actually changed and influenced activism and freedom of her people to the point of even being a candidate to be the face of the $20 bill of America. I genuinely feel like she should have been more commemorized. I feel like a lot of people kind of sweeped her under the rug for a few years. Thank God now a lot of people are now researching, you know, looking into the past. So yeah, I think she should have had more recognition in general. She should have been way more respected, way more valued. But as we all know, most great people, especially if they are people of color, on top of that, if they are women, they really aren't as valued in history as they should be. Growing up in such circumstances and reaching the heights that she reached is practically impossible to compare to anyone else. The risks she took in order to save people from the hands of slavery, torture, abuse, racism, and inevitably death are actually kind of incomprehensible. She demonstrated the strength that black women have and how they are actually the keys of turning history upside down when we need it the most. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did, and I genuinely feel like we should do more to appreciate women such as Harriet every day. So yes, I hope you do your research into her. If you're going to be traveling to the USA, definitely check out Maryland. I hope you tune into the next episode. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you liked it and liked hearing about Harriet as much as I did. Sending you all love and blessings. Goodbye. Have a nice week and tune into the next one.